Welcome to Black Hat Briefings, held November 21st through the 22nd, 2001, in Amsterdam. This is videotape number 5B, a continuation. Uh, we kind of left at uh, the end of Code Red 1. Uh, now we'll be looking at Code Red 2, uh, which was a completely different worm uh, following Code Red 1. Um, just like Code Red 1, however, it did, uh, it, it did focus on uh, the, the same vulnerability, the, the IDA vulnerability in IIS. Um, it, it does have some aspects that were similar to, to Code Red 1. Uh, things like uh, the fact that basically the exploitation technique was exactly alike with the exception that for Code Red 2 it used the, the X character instead of the N character. Uh, ba basically other than that infection uh, phase is basically the same. Uh, one of the other things that it did do was it, it did leave a physical Trojan on the system which could easily be used to identify the existence of Code Red 2. Okay, um, as, as far as propagation, uh, Code Red 2 was very, very, very much smarter than Code Red 1. Um, it used uh, a, a statistical distribution uh, on target selection that seriously favored hosts that were on the same subnet, uh, class, uh, class C subnet, uh, and then followed up by uh, favoring class B subnets, and then uh, a small percentage of them could spread basically to any, any host on the internet. Um, now I'm going to show you the, the, the pieces of code that, uh, that actually do this stuff. Okay, um, Code Red 2, um, just like Code Red 1, uh, was basically uh, multi-threaded. Uh, it spawned a bunch of threads. Uh, Code Red 2, as opposed to Code Red 1, uh, favored attacking Chinese hosts. Uh, on a Chinese host, it would spawn uh, 600 threads. On a non-Chinese host, it would spawn 300 threads. Uh, this right here is basically the top of the process that gets called uh, every time uh, a thread is created. Uh, basically what happens here is that it goes down and checks the number of uh, threads that are uh, currently active. Uh, and, and if it's not above the, the, the required number, it, it will create a thread. Now when each thread is created, like Code Red 1, it spawns at the very beginning of the, uh, of the code. So basically you end up with between 300 and 600 uh, exact replicas sitting in memory. Um, also like Code Red 1, it did use a small amount of shared, uh, shared memory between all these threads to deal with things like thread count and, and local IP storage and, and the like. Um, basically what happens is, uh, Code, uh, Code Red 2 did not have uh, a, an attacking payload. Uh, it was more about weakening the host that it was uh, residing on, uh, setting it up for potentially a later attack. Uh, one of the things that, let's see here, um, uh, the, the propagation methods basically, let's see here, I just lost myself here. <laughs> Um, one of the uh, one of the creation methods or, or the propagation method was specifically to um, to go through and create an address that it was going to attack, um, and then oh. let's see here. Okay, um, it creates uh, a series of octets uh, that, uh, that form an internet address. Then finally, it goes through, creates a socket to connect to that. Um, unlike Code Red, 
This uses some more advanced socket techniques, uh, like non-blocking sockets for the connect, uh, that gives uh, a much higher degree of uh, handling errors in, in the connect process. Uh, basically, a, a much more streamlined process in how it's spreading. Uh, what, what happens is it creates the socket. It, then right here, uh, it issues an IOCTL on the socket. Um, and that will set it to non-blocking. Uh, it issues a connect against the target IP on port 80. Uh, and, and then, as you can see here, it's actually checking for the, the errors coming back from connect. Um, one, of the, one of the other things, because it's non-blocking, is that it does use a select statement. Um, if you're familiar with uh, Windows sockets at all, basically, uh, select is to check for so uh, sockets that are in a specific, sa uh, specific state. Um, once it finds a connection that actually happened, it puts itself in non-blocking, uh, simply so that it doesn't have to waste uh, code space and going through select anymore. Uh, uh, it, it issues uh, on an error, it'll close. Otherwise, what it does is it sends uh, its entire chunk of code off uh, and then waits on a receive. Once the server received that code, it'll spit out a, a, a chunk uh, and it knows that it succeeded. Uh, then the socket's closed and this loops. So basically what happens is you have 300 threads or 600 threads on Chinese systems going through uh, attempting to propagate. Now, as I showed before here, the, um, the target selection uh, it is based on your network. Uh, when, when Code Red starts, it gets your IP. Uh, and, and using this probability-based uh, matrix here, it will select uh, potentially the, uh, any of the zero octets and replace them with uh, a pseudo-random number, basically meaning that 50% um, of the time it will be within your class C. 37.5 will be within your class B, and then 12.5% it will be a potentially random host. Next up here, I'm going to show you uh, a little bit about the payload of Code Red, now, or Code Red 2, rather. Um, Code Red 2 did a, a number of things. Uh, as I said before, they were primarily designed to weaken the system uh, and provide other ways of entry into the system. Uh, one, of the, one of the parts that it did was to create um, a, a, a Trojan command executable in the web directory called root.exe. Um, basically, it will copy, um, I'm just going to find where I'm going here. Um, Okay. Um, basically, what it does is it goes through and issues uh, a get system directory so that it can find the Windows system directory. Uh, and then uh, it, it adds slash CMD on the end of it. So you have a buffer that, that basically equates out to C colon winnt system32 slash command.exe, or CMD.exe, rather. Um, what it does then is that it will go through and uh, by these embedded numbers here, uh, this one says D colon. What actually happens is that this process goes through twice, one for C and one for D. Um, and initially, what's going to happen here is it's going to copy this CMD into uh, C colon inet pub scripts root.exe uh, and then again uh, into D colon inet, uh, uh, inet pub scripts root.exe. Uh, and basically what this does is um, uh, inetpub scripts uh, is an often mapped virtual directory to the slash scripts uh, folder in, uh, in most IS systems. Now, by copying a command uh, executable there uh, and renaming it to root, that allows you to basically execute any command uh, in the iUser, which is an unprivileged account, across the internet. Um, it's the same type of technique that was used uh, to exploit attacks like Unicode 
and double decode, but you're not limited to a, a bug here. You basically have a CGI program that is acting as a command interpreter. Um, it, it does it in uh, inetpub. It also does it in uh, MSADC, which is uh, a, another commonly mapped uh, virtual directory. Uh, after it goes through and creates those two, um, a, a big chunk of code in, in the CodeRed2 binary is, is a, a, partially, uh, a partially compressed uh, copy of a, a Trojan that, that basically will do some other bad things. And I'll show you the Trojan in a minute here. But basically, all these data bytes are, are code for the Trojan, and they're embedded right in the middle. What it does is it creates a file in the root of the C or D drive um, named explorer.exe. Now, what, um, what that does is there's actually a bug in Windows NT that would accept uh, the C drive before it accepted the explorer.exe in, uh, in, in the system directory. What that allowed this to do is the next time that you log on, um, and you execute explorer.exe as your command shell, uh, putting all your pretty pictures up on Windows, it would execute the Trojan one. Uh, and I'll show you how the Trojan one then executes the legitimate one here in a minute. Um, but as you can see, all of these little FCs here, um, these are actually compression characters. Um, each FC is designed to be replaced by 20 hex, uh, which is 32 uh, binary null bytes. Um, they, they chose not to do it uh, like uh, the traditional way simply because this program ends up being a lot bigger that way. They found a common uh, byte pattern that they could overwrite uh, and, and expand. Um, uh, basically, this all happens here in Create Explorer. Um, basically, it uses an lcreate file, uh, file name. Uh, and what lcreate is, is it's a, a runtime library creation function to create a file. Uh, it then uses lwrite to write individual bytes of that very large string out here until it sees an fc. Now, let's see here. OK. Um, basically, I'm looking for my fc here. Uh, um, it, it, it's around here. I just can't read my comments anymore. Um, b basically, what it does is every time it sees that FC, it'll write out 20 bytes rather than an FC. And it loops through this program, writes it all out, and then when it's done, it goes to, um, it, it actually reboots the system. So the next time that you run, uh, run your Windows, you actually log in. Win login will spawn Explorer, which is the Trojan Explorer. And what I'm going to do now is I also have a disassembly of the Explorer uh, Trojan so I can show you kind of what is actually happening there. Um, again, this comes down to uh, Explorer is being treated as um, a, a binary Windows executable rather than, um, uh, rather than a, a piece of baseless code now because it's uh, when it's written out, it is actually a valid Windows PE file. Uh, so a as you can see here, we have different segments. Um, we have a start sec uh, section, a text section, and uh, a an actual data section. Now, um, this is all, excuse me, um, this is all valid in a Win32 environment, um, and, and these all have their places. Uh, and this is the file that was written out. Uh, what happens is when it starts, um, it gets the Windows directory, uh, the, the system32 directory, uh, and, and it takes that returned buffer <coughs> and supply, uh, appends explorer.exe on the end of it. Uh, then what it does is it uses winexec here to execute your real explorer.exe. So now, if you looked in your task list, you'd have two explorer.exe's, one of them being a Trojan, and one of them being legitimate. They, they probably won't look alike. One of them would probably use a lot more memory than the other, but you actually have two of them sitting there. 
um, what, what then happens uh, is it goes into this short loop here um, where it basically sleeps for about, uh, it, it sets some register keys, sleeps for about two minutes, uh, and then goes through and continues through this process. Uh, do reg set um, is, is a series of calls to registry keys uh, that serve to weak, uh, further weaken the system. Um, basically, it goes through um, and it creates uh, a, a it, it creates the the scripts directory and makes it executable. It creates the msadc directory and makes it executable. Both those uh, whether they're uh, whether they're there, oftentimes they're turned off, sometimes they're deleted. This makes sure that they're there. This is so that you can get to the, the planted root.exe. Um, the, the other two things that it does that are pretty dangerous is that it directly maps the C drive and the D drive to slash C and slash D respectively on the web server. This gives a, an outside entity full, uh, full access at the IWAM privilege level to your entire hard drives. Um, uh, from that, you can continue to execute, uh, execute further code or um, just steal files. Um, that, that's basically the, uh, the core of what um, the explorer.exe Trojan did. As I said before, it executes before the other one. There is actually a patch out now that will fix that process, but um, uh, it did affect a lot of people. Okay, next up here. Um, this is actually one that I'm very happy about. Um, we, we really didn't talk about this much in our um, disassembly uh, originally um, because we, we didn't actually take a very good look at it until well after Code Red had blown over. Um, a, about a day after we published our initial Code Red analysis, we got a, a, a basically an anonymous post from a government lab saying, hey, we, seen the, uh, we have seen this worm out there about four months ago. Um, and, and this is prior to Code Red 1. Uh, what happened was a, a very similar worm exploiting a very different undisclosed vulnerability uh, had been traversing around the networks before. Nobody knew about it. It was reported to various reporting agencies, but they chose to not respond to it. Um, so basically, it was four months before Code, Run, uh, Code Red 1, there was a warning shot out there that people didn't understand. Um, there, there's a couple reasons, uh, political reasons and just time reasons that nobody actually, uh, nobody actually saw it. Um, what, okay, um, what I'm going to start out here is that this is, uh, th this worm uh, attacked a, a, a fi uh, Although about two and a half years ago, EI um, published details on an HDR vulnerability. Um, yep. Uh, does this worm have a name? Nope. Okay. Never, we never gave it one. Nobody really uh, noticed, and we didn't really talk about it very much. So um, it, nobody, it, it just never happened that way. Um, this, this is actually a different vulnerability than uh, than the HDR vulnerability that we had, uh, we had found. The patch that fixed the HDR vulnerability also fixed this one. So in reality, there's been a good two to three years of patched NT4 systems out there. However, this is a, a, an undisclosed bug that somebody's been keeping in their pocket and decided to write a worm about, um, which is like the doomsday scenario that everybody's worried about. Fortunately for all of us, it's kind of a lame old bug so it never really took off. But this, this just goes to show that details don't need to be available for somebody to write a worm. Um, basically, what's happening here is that these are a bunch of different addresses uh, being replicated here. Um, uh, and what happens is down further, uh, you end up with a little bit of code. And, and it took us a few times to go through this and see this is what, what was actually happening. But basically what happens is that this is right here a, a decryption <coughs> algorithm uh, that's used to uh, DXOR the, the worm. And, and as you can tell, there's a bunch of garbage down here. 
uh, the, the reason that it was XOR encoded was because like a lot of standard exploits, you simply cannot put null bytes in them. Uh, Code Red used an innovative placement of its data to avoid that problem. Uh, most exploits that are written now are XOR encoded. This one is no exception. Now, obviously, this doesn't mean a whole lot to anybody because it's all uh, XOR encrypted. Uh, this is where IDA really, really kicks ass. Um, the, uh, inside of IDA, there's a, there's a system called IDC. Uh, it's a C-like scripting language that allows you to do uh, automatic things to your data. Um, so what I did is, uh, I I if you follow this uh, system here, basically we're clearing uh, ECX here, we're loading a byte, um, and, and up here is where we actually set up everything. But basically, we load a byte, we XOR CA uh, against AL uh, to see if AL is null. If it is, then we jump down to our code. Uh, otherwise, we go through and um, compare it. Uh, if it doesn't, then uh, uh, <laughs> um, we, we compare uh, AL against 30 hex. If it is, then we jump over XOR decrypting that byte, and we just subtract and place the byte. Uh, what we do then, uh, basically, is we go through and we XOR against AA. Now, I created a, an IDC file. And I thought I had it in there. Um, Wrong word. Um, and I'm just going to show you um, kind of what it looks like here. Um, basically, what we have going on is the exact same situation. It's basically in a C context. Um, we have a static decrypt. That it's the only function that we call. I personally put the, uh, the length in here um, and the base address right here. Um, so that we could walk through this. Um, uh, again, if, no, uh, I if the byte that we just got was a null, that means that we're at the end of our string. We skip that, uh, or, or we're done then. Uh, if, uh, if the byte is equal to 30, we go through, we get the next byte, um, or, or we increase that, we, get, we point to the next byte, and we decrease it by 40. Uh, that's just basically the equivalent of the ASM that I just showed you over here um, in a C-like format. Um, what then happens is that we patch the byte back, uh, or we XOR it against AA, and, and we put the byte back into the, uh, back into the disassembly. Um, I, again, these are all fairly automatic. If I just do this, it just, uh, I don't know if you saw that, but it went down through here. This is now code where it actually makes sense. Uh, and you can go down here and Ba uh, basically, what you end up with is, um, I think I went too far there. OK. Um, but what we have is we have imports that we're loading. Um, Basically, these are just like before. We're going through. We have basically the exact same import table that we had in Code Red 1. Um, and even down to, I, I, I'm just not going to run through all this stuff, but, um, but you can see worm.com, just like Code Red 1, um, C colon not worm. Um, but the, uh, the really one that gets people is that you see uh, fuck USA hacked by Chinese. Um, so basically what this is, is that this is Code Red four months before anybody had ever heard of Code Red in the wild using undisclosed vulnerabilities. Lucky, uh, again, luckily it wasn't a very powerful undisclosed vulnerability. Otherwise, we'd have all been running around with uh, not a clue as to what the hell was going on. Um, I, I, again, I, I haven't went through and 
completely disassembled this worm simply because there's really no value in knowing beyond what uh, beyond the fact that it's very similar to Code Red. There are a few byte change differences, but I believe that's mostly for platform uh, reasons versus functionality reasons. Um, and just checking time here. Um, uh, for right now, I will go over some of uh, some of the NIMDA code, actually. Um, NIMDA was probably the last big worm that we've seen here. Uh, it affected a ton of people. Um, it, it actually had a whole lot going on in it. Um, it, it attacked both clients and servers. Uh, it, it infected it, uh, files similar to vir uh, using viral techniques. Um, it, it basically just had a ton of stuff happening in it. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to cover the whole disassembly. I'm just going to go through some specific parts that, that are interesting to how it was propagating, how it was, uh, what some of the payloads were. Um, just as a, a, a quick little side here, I'm going to flip here. Um, OK, next slide. Uh, NIMDA. Um, basically, it, it used um, all of the vulnerabilities. <laughs> All of the vulnerabilities that NIMDA used were disclosed sometimes up to a year before uh, any of them were used here. Um, it used basically four different ways. Three of them were really vulnerabilities. The, the fourth was just a, a poor computing practice. Um, basically, it used a technique that allowed code to be executed uh, through my, uh, incorrect MIME handling uh, in Outlook and IE. Specifically, it's because Outlook uses the IE to view HTML email messages. Um, it, it also implemented and, and used to propagate both the Unicode and the double decode attacks. Uh, and, and the Unicode attack has been around for a very, very long time, as I'm sure you all know. Um, finally, what it did is uh, any type of open share that it could find it would attempt to replicate itself across to files located on those, uh, on those shares. Um, that that kind of gives a, a lot of different ways that, that this worm can spread, and it also makes an administrator's job that much harder having to close potentially all these different holes. Um, now into the code. Um, this is uh, basically uh, a, a very little touched uh, binary of NIMDA. Excuse me. Um, I did do a little bit of uh, write up on it simply because it made it a little bit easier to show you guys what was going on. Um, uh, again, NIMDA is a Trojan type of um, uh, type of code. It, it actually is a a little bit different because it's actually both a DLL and an executable. It has basically full functioning parts to be both uh, a dynamically loaded library and an executable. And depending on how it's called, it does act different. Um, let's see here. I'm going to crank open my, uh, my tags here. Uh, I'm going to first start out with uh, propagation. Um, okay, for for propagation, first we will cover um, uh, how it's actually using email. Um, to get the email addresses that it sent through, uh, it used uh, a, a set of Mappy calls. Mappy is the Microsoft Messaging API. Uh, it's what Outlook uses. Basically, it's a series of APIs internal to the program designed to uh, facilitate mail sending. However, it doesn't actually send using those. What it does is it actually has a built-in SMTP system. 
uh, that will connect out to a remote uh, uh, SMTP server and actually deal as a client connecting to that to send the email. Um, a as you can tell, uh, by, by the, the way I found this was by looking in the strings. You can go through and um, find the various different um, the various different calls. Hello. Hello is a reci uh, recipient to, mail from. These are all SMTP commands. And as you can tell here, they all are basically, in the, or a bunch of them are in the same functions here. So by using a cross-reference, here I am, hello, it sends the computer name, mail from, and it gets the, the email address from uh, the Mappy call. Uh, it sends a slash r slash n to, to go to the next line. Recipient 2 uh, gets the recipient from, uh, from the uh, Mappy client, and then data. Now, one of, one of the funny things about this is, if you can see here, basically NIMDA, I, I'm almost positive it was written using a, a basically a C compiler. Uh, it's got string copies and string cats pounded all the way through it, and there are a lot of overflows within NIMDA itself. Uh, so in theory, you could attack the NIMDA virus by uh, sending specific emails or feeding it junk data. You could cause it to overflow and even take control of EIP within the, within the Trojan. Um, uh, again, you know, it's just showing the from, uh, the subject, and, and, and all these are string cats and string copies. So uh, ba basically, that's how it's using its uh, internal SMTP system to shoot off a mail. Um, what do we got next here? Open shares. Um, basically, how NIMDA went through and uh, shot across open shares is that any time it found a drive, it would deal with um, placing copies of itself out there. Typically, it used the name readme.exe or readme.eml. Um, other times, it uses admin.dll or rich-e32 or 20.dll, which is an internal Word document. Um, basically, what it's doing is it, it's finding any spot that it can dump itself uh, and pumping it out there. This combined with the fact that NIMDA infected hosts have open guest shares uh, is, is a pretty deadly combination. Um, uh, so basically what it's doing here uh, is it's picking up readme.eml, um, copying it onto the, the path that it has found, uh, and then uh, basically create file and it dumps a copy of itself over there. Um, basically, what, what's happening here is that this is a, a way where NIMDA can continually drop copies of itself all over. Uh, a lot of times, uh, they're just inactive copies that never get run. Sometimes, uh, for instance, with the, the RICHE20.dll, -E um, there, there's actually a bug in Office that if you open a file, in the same directory that that DLL is, uh, it will execute code from that DLL rather than using a Word one. So that, that's another method that it began to propagate. Um, again, not all of NIMDA's techniques for propagation were completely technical. So it kind of is a hybrid worm and virus. Um, uh, one, one of the, the final ways that it continued to, to spread was it used a, a bunch of standard techniques for attacking web servers. Um, let's see here. OK, this part here um, is actually the part that builds the URL to send to the remote system to attack with, uh, to attack with various attacks. Now, um, basically, what happens is we have a bunch of different, um, different chunks of a, a double decode and a unicode attack. Uh, as you can see here, it's looking for a double decode off of the scripts directory. Um, and here, it's using standard unicode chunks to build um, potential attacks that it can use against, uh, the, it can use against uh, the host to execute code.
when and if one of these attacks do occur, uh, it will use the TFTP protocol to download a copy of itself called admin.dll. Um, once that's on the remote side, it treats it as a CGI script and can use that to execute itself, uh, which then infects that system. One of the things that once a system is infected, uh, any HTML or ASP file that you see is going to have a, a, a copy of, uh, a MIME encoded copy uh, of the, the readme.exe plunked on the end of it. And what that will do is that the next time somebody views that HTML, it's back to the Outlook IE vulnerability and it attempts to automatically execute that. So it had a, a, a very big chain of uh, uh, different ways they could spread around and it, that, that was one of the hardest parts of dealing with NIMDA is to close all of the individual holes and make sure that all of the HTML was clean. Um, and, and then, even then, you still have people who click on it when they get it, even, even if it's not automatically going. Um, next up here, we're going to talk a little bit about the various things that NIMDA actually did to a system once it was infected, the, the sort of payload rather than the propagation techniques that it used. Um, one of the things here. Um, the first part that I'm going to talk about here um, is how it opened shares. Uh, it, it actually physically added users and opened shares available to these users. Um, this is a, a severe system weakening. Uh, what it did is it added a guest, oh, yep. um, it added a guest account to the, uh, to the local machine. And it did this using a win exec for the net user account, or, or the net user command, or the net local group command. Um, what it did here, as you can see, is that it issued net with an um, uh, argument of user guest add. Now, what that did is if for some reason there wasn't a guest account, which is default, uh, uh, guest accounts are default on all NT and 2000 systems, uh, it, it added this account. Uh, typically they are disabled, which is where the second uh, command comes in. It creates that account, or it makes that account active, uh, meaning that it has login privileges, uh, you can authenticate against it. Finally, uh, it adds, uh, or I'm not finally, but <laughs> next, it adds uh, the guest account to the guest's local group. Um, that pr it's probably already there, but it wants to make sure that it uh, clears everything. And although you can't see this because the, the comments have slid off, I'll hop over here. What it does is a, uh, a net local group administrator's guest add. And what this does is it adds the guest account that was just created and made active to the local group administrators, which, uh, as you all know, in NT basically grants you most of the privileges that you'd need to do anything on, a, uh, on an NT box. Um, what next comes up, and this is the really, really dangerous part, uh, is that it goes through and issues a net user guest no password. So now you have a local guest account on your machine in the administrators group that's active and has no password, meaning that anybody anywhere can connect to any shared resource that you have, be it a printer, be it a, sh uh, a drive that you're sharing, or uh, ev even your IPC connection. And IPC is used to enumerate users, authenticate against different RPC resources. So ba basically at that point, anybody anywhere can connect with basically no credentials with an administrative access on that machine. Um, uh, th it, as if that wasn't enough for it to do, um, the, the next part of the payload that it did is it went through and infected a bunch of system binaries. Um, meaning, uh, typically what it did was that it would replace the system binary um, and then keep a, a local copy of it inside of itself, like a, a, an embedded copy of it. And anytime it gets called, it writes out the original, executes the original, and then goes on about its business of further infecting your systems. Um, 
we'll go to payload two here. Um, this part is where, just want to double check where I am here. Um, oh, this is for uh, introducing itself as a, a, a system binary. Um, lost where I was supposed to be here. <laughs> OK. Um, uh, uh, basically, uh, right here is where it's showing what it's going to copy itself over. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, the, the rich ed 20 .dll, um, and, and it also places itself originally in a copy of MMC. MMC is a Microsoft Management Console. It's used for most system administration purposes since about NT4 or Service Pack 4 or so. Um, basically, what we got going on here is that uh, we're, uh, we create this, and then we issue a copy file. Um, so we have our copy that we're running, um, and, and we copy it over the top of MMC. Um, next time MMC gets called, we were basically calling NIMDA and further our infection. Um, it does this for mmc.exe, uh, load.exe, and uh, riched20.dll. Um, it also plays as copies of itself as readme.exe and readme.eml and admin.dll all throughout the hard drive. What uh, basically it's laying traps for future. Uh, for future clicking. Um, one, one of the other things that it does is that it will change uh, the, the various, um, uh, change the various uh, register keys that are out there. Um, some of the ones that it, it tends to attack <laughs> happen to be things like uh, keys that specify security and land managed errors. In other words, by deleting a series of keys, it can create basically a zero share pol or a zero protection on your share policy, um, meaning that anybody anywhere, regardless of the fact that the guest account was taken, um, anybody anywhere can just connect and have full privileges to your shell or, or to your uh, shared drives. Um, let's see here, um, some of the some of the various keys that it does deal with are. Um, uh, this is specifically the one that it uses to open shares, uh, H key, local machine, system service, uh, current control set services, landman server, which is the, the services key that's pertinent to all the different landman services, be they shares or uh, dealing with RPC and whatnot. Um, this one specifically goes after shares. Um, what we got also going on, uh, so a lot of the code in here um, really isn't pertinent to an NT discussion. Uh, there's a lot in here that, that only happens on uh, Windows 95, Windows 98, and ME. Um, uh, I just don't really touch those operating systems very much, so uh, they, they don't hold a whole lot of interest. But there is a lot of various registry keys that are doing basically the equivalent on 95. Um, we just never see them in our lab because we don't use 95. Um, uh, here's just going through the strings here. This is one that you should probably notice. Um, this is why NIMDA, when it first began, was being called concept virus. Uh, why they claim it was a Chinese hack. Uh, I, I guess it's uh, a good idea to copyright your viruses nowadays, but you know, I, I, I guess to uh, however you want to do it. But um, like, like I said, we go through and we add uh, and modify a bunch of registry keys. Uh, things like removing share protection, uh, opening up, uh, let's see if I can find the other one here. Um, oh, this one is actually kind of interesting. Internally, NIMDA is actually using some of the performance monitoring libraries to deal with internal counters. Um, it, it uses them to keep track of various things that are happening on the system. Uh, kind of a, a different track for uh, a, a virus to take, but uh, interesting nonetheless. Um, I guess 
Next up, um, next up on the payload system, um, Nimda will uh, take the, the Windows directory and then a file called winanit.ini. Um, and this is kind of a holdover from back in the old days um, where Windows still used INI instead of the registry. Uh, this file specifically is used oftentimes by installers to remove or change files that are currently in access. Um, what Nimda did uh, is that it would write out to this so that it would have a, a series uh, potentially deleting files or removing them uh, from like temp directories and whatnot, trying to hide after itself. Uh, it could have did a lot more here, but luckily it didn't. Um, basically what happens is the next time you reboot, uh, the, the series of commands uh, put forth in the winanit.ini are going to be executed. Uh, supposedly, uh, Nimda screwed with a bunch of installers. Uh, we didn't test it that deep, but um, because it played with this file, some files were lost and some installations got screwed up. Um, finally, there's one more part of, uh, of the payload system in Nimda that actually may be no, I guess not. <laughs> um, ba basically, what Nimda will do um, is it, it places itself as load.exe, and then it uses uh, uh, system.ini. Um, and Um, it places itself as load.exe, and then using system.ini, um, it will go through and make uh, an, an entry so that it runs load.exe every time it starts. I Meaning every time you start up your machine, if Nimda is there, it's going to be running. Um, Nimda attaches itself behind the explorer.exe thread, so you won't see anything in the task manager. Um, it, do, it, it issues a create remote thread to do that process. Uh, it's the same process that BO2K uses to hide. A bunch of different spywares use it to hide. Basically, it's a way that you can shift command into a different process's memory space. Um, and that's pretty much uh, what I got on NIMDA here. Uh, kind of concludes our uh, in-depth and under the hood of all these different worms. What we're going to go over now, um, you know, worms suck. They're, we got to have something to do. Uh, to, to keep them from annihilating the internet every one to five months. Um, so we, we put together our heads and came up with a bunch of different techniques that, that we feel um, would, would really help the internet as a whole in dealing with, one, keeping worms from ever spreading to begin with, and two, dealing with them very quickly and effectively when they do actually get out. Um, one of the strongest things is that there really does need to be a common reporting mechanism. Uh, one of the, the problems with Code Red is that there's five different reporting agencies and nobody had any kind of solid statistical analysis. Nobody had any kind of real global scope on what it is. Uh, certain people would report to more than one agency. Certain people would just not report. We need a common standard format where anybody that you report to gets correlated in with Everybody, uh, everybody else's data, regardless of who you report it to or who you are reporting. Um, to do that, we're going to need a lot better data sharing in the information world. Um, we need, uh, on individual networks, we need IDS deployments and, and monitoring tools out there that are centralizing their logging. And from that, we need those centralized logging spots to feed um, a, a, a reporting uh, agency like Security Focus's ARIS, like CERT or SANS, uh, any large uh, organization that can handle the kind of uh, information that's being pumped to it. Uh, to, to even further that, we, we really need a solid way where ARIS, SANS, CERT, and all these large reporting agencies, be they government, be they commercial, be they any of those, um, 
we need a way where these organizations can share data in, in a nice collective manner so that we can get a real honest global picture of what's going on. Um, uh, unfortunately, that, that opens up a whole new can of worms. Um, basically, when you have that much data, there's, it's pretty hard to deal with. Um, what we need to look at is ways that we can reduce uh, somebody reporting to two different agencies and that event being counted twice in the global scale of things, um, or potentially multiple times. Um, uh, we need a way where we can do very large scale statistical analysis. Um, you know, computing power has grown phenomenally over the last 10 years, 20 years, but you know, so is the amount of data that we have to deal with on a daily basis. So we, we need a, a, a good trade-off where we can get pertinent data from huge amounts of network sensor data in real or near real time. Um, uh, and the corollary of that is that obviously there would need to be a heavy investment from either a nonprofit organization or a government into huge amounts of storage, huge amounts of processing power, and, and of, of course, massive network bandwidth to be able to handle all of the incoming information and be able to report on it. Um, plus, this has to be done uh, redundantly, of course, so that if there is a, a denial of service, it doesn't become the target. So we have to uh, we have to look at a lot of different um, avenues, but we really do feel that there needs to be a lot more analysis uh, on what's actually going on. Um, and, and on that, uh, I'm just by looking at the, the ERIS reports of uh, Code Red 1 and 2 and the various uh, other reports that were done, uh, that when, when a worm is around, you can tell. Network traffic degrades. Uh, the number of attacks for any specific type of exploit uh, just shoot through the roof. Uh, you can tell statistically if it's an automated attack or uh, just some kids playing around. Um, 700,000 uh, 700, hosts don't get owned in a week uh, any way but a worm. It just doesn't happen any other way. So I, if we have good global data, um, we can see trends like this. We can spot worm strikes very early on, giving people a chance to disassemble the worm, understand what's going on, and produce some solid results on, on what needs, uh, what patches need to be applied, and, and whatnot. Um, one of the other things that you can do um, to mitigate worms uh, on your own networks uh, is to look at the environment that these worms operate in. Um, I mean, you can go as a, uh, as far off as the Gartner group says you should and just ditch IS, obviously there won't be any more IS worms hitting you. However, I really don't feel that that solves the problem. Um, sometimes in worms, there are lysine deficiencies. Uh, lysine deficiencies in this case uh, are based on a, a, a concept written about by Caesar uh, in, in a paper called Lysine Deficiencies in Viral Systems, I believe. Uh, it's available on www.rootkit.com. Um, basically, it's a, it's a phrase taken from a movie called Jurassic Park, where there was a, 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 a chemical called lysine that was fed to the dinosaurs to make sure that they would continue to live. And had any of them broken out, they wouldn't be getting their lysine, and so they would die. Worms oftentimes have environmental dependencies that act just like lysine deficiencies. Uh, there are often things that you can do in, a, in the situation of a worm or a virus that when implemented, you can go through and stop that virus from spreading further. Things like adding mutexes, uh, removing mutexes. Uh, it, for Code Red, there was a not worm file that if that file existed, it simply would not spread any further. Now these are all uh, what I'd like to call like half-ass defenses. Um, they're, they're not solving the problem, they're just stopping it so that you can actually have enough time to go through and solve it. Um, one of the big problems with uh, network computing today is that most shops are a monoculture. They have one type of system, cut, uh, cut early on and replicate it over and over and over. Now what this does is this gives a very ripe uh, environment for any kind of agent that's going to go in there, uh, be it code red, be it an attacker. Um, t 
typically, in a situation like that, if there's one thing wrong on one machine, it's probably going to be replicated to hundreds or even thousands of machines. That, that makes it really a, a, an effective target for worms and for uh, viruses. Um, other times in worms, we, uh, the, the worm author makes assumptions. Uh, it hard, uh, they can hard code uh, network addresses, memory locations, or, or even do something as weird as design the code so that um, it, it's assuming network byte order. Uh, basically, uh, what, what we can do is we can change situations. Uh, it happened during Code Red where the, where the author hard-coded the www.whitehouse.gov in uh, by, by proper alerting and uh, action by the network backbone providers, we removed a lot of the, the potential for problem just by, by changing that one assumption. Um, sometimes uh, worms do make memory location uh, assumptions. Uh, they assume that this DLL is going to be loaded at this base address or this function is going to be at this specific point in memory. Uh, a lot of times, even myself, when writing exploits for XYZ server uh, to save space, I'll hard code memory addresses. I realize that it only works with the specific instance that I'm at, typically a single service pack, but sometimes that's all you need. Uh, I in this case, uh, the worm used RVA techniques to, to get its addresses at runtime that's not as uh, adequate during any of these. But uh, nonetheless, something to consider. If, if you do change some base addresses on some DLLs uh, in, in your programs, uh, it could cause uh, an exploit to stop working just based on the merit of, uh, uh, on the fact that your addresses don't line up. Uh, uh, again, these are all small steps that you can do to make spreading worms more difficult. I, I really recommend, you know, running solid code, uh, making sure that, uh, you know, you have a good firewall rule set, that you actively watch for new vulnerabilities, and that you patch. Those are the, the real, honest to goodness, finally going to get the worm situation under control. But uh, there are other options also. Um, this is a, a a fairly hot topic um, that's been beat up on a lot of security mailing lists. The concept of a counter worm is writing a worm that uses the same uh, propagation methods uh, as, as, and infection methods as the original worm, but this time it uh, includes a type of fix. Um, as a security professional, I'm not sure if this is such a great idea. However, there have been a lot of very solid arguments to the fact that 700,000 systems uh, were owned in about a week's time uh, and none of them went to the trouble to do any kind of patching, uh, e even though that was a month old. Um, th there are issues with this, uh, both ethical and technical. Um, I if you write a, a counter worm to attack a specific a uh, specific series of machines or a specific vulnerability, uh, what if you write it wrong and it starts crashing machines? Uh, I mean, th then you have two rampant worms out there causing trouble. Um, one of the things that if anybody does decide to write one of these, um, I, I really recommend that you put very tight limits. Um, make sure that you're checking every error code that, that you're going to be planning. Uh, and make sure that you limit it to specific net blocks that you are actually in control of. Um, we really don't need another worm on the internet. Um, e even if it's a helpful worm, it's still uh, traffic that's potentially pounding millions of servers every minute. You know, uh, just, just not the best way to, to go about doing it. But uh, just like the early Xerox people, if you want one for your network, yeah, uh, that, that's your network. Um, Finally, our, our last part here uh, is we're going to discuss some of the future of worms. Um, basically, again, this is us sitting around thinking about looking at what we've seen so far uh, and, and kind of envisioning where we really think that worms are going to be. Uh, unfortunately, it's not a very bright future. Um, 
what, what we're going to see, uh, and actually we were discussing this a little bit before NIMDA came out, and then NIMDA came out as a proof of concept on this, um, is that we're going to start seeing some uh, different attack vectors, like multiple ways that a worm can get into a system. NIMDA had four to five different ways they could infect you. I, I think that's only going to get bigger and worse. Uh, I, I can see attacks using buffer overflows like code red, uh, potentially format string attacks, um, uh, attacking things like design flaws and protocols uh, is a very under, uh, under-touched subject right now, but uh, potentially it could be very dangerous to have a worm out there attacking weak ISN numbers uh, in the TCP protocol uh, and building spoofed, pro uh, spoofed sessions just randomly. Um, and finally, like open shares, that, that actually falls under more just bad computing practice but there, there are, I, I'm anticipating uh, worms in the future that, that basically pick from a big bucket of potential vulnerabilities, typically within the last three months, because everybody knows that nobody patches on time. Um, so you, you begin to get a, a continuing thing where once you have a framework for a worm, plugging in new vulnerabilities isn't that difficult. Um, Yep, misconfigurations, uh, just poor decisions and how you're going to start your system there. Um, one of the other techniques that we've discussed uh, as, a, as a future of worms is to use less than visible ways of propagating or communicating uh, if that's where uh, worms may go. Um, one of the things uh, uh, about covert channel stuff is that it looks like norma uh, normal traffic. Um, they've been able to effectively put data inside things like DC, uh, DNS traffic. Um, uh, the, the Loki project uh, run by Mike Schiffman <coughs> uh, was able to successfully embed a full TCP session within ICMP. Uh, the, these things aren't places where normal people or, or where people normally look to, to even think about seeing vir uh, virus and worm traffic, but um, as a, as effective measures are being placed for uh, watching web worms and email worms, they may resort to a, a trickier method um, that can be uh, e either non-standard data transmission. And it, it could be as weird as having modems. Uh, you find a modem on a system and you use it to dial into an internet connection somewhere else and then bounce it off of that. Uh, you know, obviously, what can be done and what has been done are completely different, but those are some of the things where, where we may not actually see uh, everything that's going on. Um, one of the other things that we were discussing um, is the a and this sort of we saw in, in the case of NIMDA um, it is like a callback mechanism where you send out a mostly encrypted worm uh, to a remote system. It infects and it, all it has is a small kernel uh, of functionality there. Uh, what that kernel, uh, the rest of the code that you shipped was either encrypted or physically not even there. Uh, what the kernel serves to do is to call back to the host that infected it and either request the key to decrypt the rest of that information or potentially get new chunks of information. Um, basically what this would do is it sets up a, a system of communication between worms that could potentially lead to much bigger and worse things. The other thing is, is that if I have a, a, a completely encrypted binary, it's based on key information that I don't have, it makes it nearly impossible to correctly decode that binary. So rather than using a netcat listener to look at one thing, unless you see that second part, you're not going to have everything that you need to disassemble that worm or do any kind of analysis on it. Um, what, we, uh, what we may see also is uh, a, a cross between worms and viruses. Um, polymorphic viruses have been around since the early, uh, early to mid 80s. Uh, basically, a polymorphic virus is one that changes every time it's run. It re-encrypts itself or re-encodes itself 
uh, using a different method. Um, this is designed to FOIL a, a most uh, static signature-based antivirus uh, things, but the same concept could be applied to a polymorphic virus to avoid IDS detection. Uh, K2 uh, did a, uh, recently did a, a, a talk on polymorphic shell code. This is roughly around the same idea where it goes through and every time the virus is spread, it's mildly different. It doesn't have to be extremely different. It just has to be different enough where it won't match the signatures out there. Um, potentially, I, I, if virus writers do get involved, um, you could even go as far as to see a, a mutation design where it specifically, will, once injected, will attempt to find better offsets or different offsets. Uh, oftentimes, when, when an IDS signature is based, it looks for where, where specific offsets are um, to, to tag that. Now, the problem with that is that if I find a different offset that's equal or better, uh, it, it doesn't matter I, that the IDS signature is now broken. So um, basically, a lot of people were looking at that very first string of code red, the, the bunch of ends, and then percent you this, 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 this. Well, that, that doesn't automatically make it a good choice. Um, what, what can happen even, uh, there, there's a ton of different profiling techniques out there. In theory, you could have a virus that's profiling itself and making it smaller faster, smarter, uh, you know, uh, there, there is no potential limit to how far that's gone. And these are, our, the sad part about it is that this isn't just speculation. Techniques like this have been used in virus writing. So it, it's, a, it's a pretty scary thought when virus uh, writers actually s sit down and learn enough security where they can start writing worms. Um, uh, there, uh, after Code Red, there was a, con uh, a concept bedded around on the concept of flash worms. A flash worm um, is estimated to uh, be like a, a pre-targeted system uh, where if I infect a host, uh, along with that infection, I send it a chunk of address space that I need it to infect further. Uh, what it requires is it requires a good topological understanding of the internet and the ability to target hosts selectively. Um, in theory, uh, if there wasn't a lot of duplication or randomness in target selection, uh, potentially every potential host that could be infected would be infected within between 5 and 20 minutes. Now, the, this concept is kind of a long ways away because obviously if you knew every infectable host before you uh, went out, you'd have to pre-scan huge chunks of the internet. However, a, a hybrid between, say, uh, code, uh, what Code Red 2 did with the local uh, uh, probability and a, a better targeting mechanism could greatly increase the speed that a worm could spread. Um, again, flash worms require a very low false positive rate because you already know what you're going to infect. It's a cascade. Um, but they have the benefit of no matter what kind of reporting mechanism we have, uh, if we see a statistical spike from uh, basically zero attacks an hour up to 50 million attacks an hour, and then it's gone the next hour, we really don't have anything to, to go on uh, unless constant monitoring and a, a capture can be taken. Yes? Uh, it, it's um, just a, uh, a, as a guess. Typically, um, you know, we get a lot of binaries, uh, a, and uh, like I said, I'm an application developer, so most of my time is spent writing code, not disassembling it. But when we get a binary, I'll usually invest between a half hour uh, and 45 minutes on it to see if there is anything interesting going on in it. Um, I if I do find that. I, I'll usually devote between uh, two and four hours to, uh, to get a pretty good high level. Um, complete disassembly of, of a program typically takes between um, 
between five hours and 30 hours, uh, like a, a smaller Trojan type program. Um, Yeah, uh, I, I mean, there, there, are, there are some very, very crazy things. Uh, concepts like Java worms. Um, Java isn't invulnerable to malicious remote agent code, no matter what anybody says. If the permissions are there, Java can spread from one JVM to another, which is similar to what you're talking about. But, exactly. Exactly. I I believe that um, I, I, IDA is extendable. You can write your own disassembly uh, tools in it, but it's, it is a horrible pain in the ass to have to do that. Oh, certainly. Oh, I, I, there, there, uh, the future of worms, it's only going to get harder to analyze, and it's, the worms are only going to get faster. Basically, we have, to, uh, we have to focus on making sure that, one, when a worm strike happens, we know about it, and two, everybody that's willing to do any kind of work uh, on worm disassembly is involved and armed with information and tools to do it correctly. Yes? Absolutely. 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 Uh, guest passwords are still one of the worst problems with computer security. Uh, easily guessable stuff. I, there, there are so many. Uh, right now, this entire talk has been focusing on uh, like buffer overflow exploitations and stuff. But the, the concept of open shares, the concept of guest passwords, uh, all of these things are glossed over a lot of times when it comes to security. But any kind of misconfiguration, as long as it's prolific, can be the base of a worm, be it uh, a, a technical problem like a buffer overflow or e like an open share. Uh, I, I guarantee if you guys go home and look on your networks, there's probably at least one share that doesn't require a password. Now, making sure that those are all closed is the first step. The other problem is, is once you have a username through a password guessing account or by hijacking somebody's machine by sending them a Trojan, then you have the next level of problems where you, you are an authenticated user on that network. So it, it's not going to stop at any point in time in the near future. So uh, basically what we need is we need to, like I said, we need to be smarter about it and faster about it. We need more people who can do it, and we need them to be able to share their information very fluidly. Um, uh, the next one, um, and this is from some work that we were looking at through intelligent agents, uh, it is uh, a, a type of worm net. Uh, once, say, a thousand worms are uh, infected, uh, they, they go into stasis, and they only talk within each other, uh, sending encoded messages. Uh, intelligent agents tend to uh, call this uh, uh, KIF, a knowledge interchange format. Um, and, and there has been a lot of work done legitimately based on agents that are able to dock to different ports on the network and, and do work in, in the name of somebody. Um, this is basically the malicious equivalent uh, where I send out a thousand probes and I hook onto your system at these thousand vulnerable points and then each one of these thousand vulnerable points can share information with any of the other nodes. Um, and, and basically, sooner or later, you begin to build the concept of the internet, where 
by knowing a, a, an internal routing table, you can get a message to any worm on that network. Um, uh, they could be uh, exchanging information, say like, uh, what's, what's a best targeted network? Once you have a thousand hosts, start sharing targeting information so that the hosts don't replicate target blocks. Um, uh, and, and obviously as this network grows, there's, there's more traffic in or, uh, involved in it. Um, uh, other information that they can share, uh, what, uh, if the worm is modular, it's possible to ship a new chunk of binary code out to a single worm on this, uh, a single node on this worm network and have it replicate to all these different things and bam, you, you can hit the latest zero day vulnerability. So worms of this type, although they're very complex uh, and, and will be very difficult to, to target and disassemble, um, may be kind of what we're looking at in the future here. Um, Another thing that, that worms uh, and actually security research has been uh, tagged on a little bit recently here um, is multi-OS shellcode. Uh, basically, uh, it would be great if a single worm uh, with a single vulnerability, say like the, the Telnet D vulnerability, uh, could hit all the FreeBSD, OpenBSD, alpha, uh, Linux alpha systems, Linux Intel systems, and basically have shellcode that's smart enough to execute the correct bits based on how the, how the operating system interacts and how the, the processor architecture interacts. Um, yeah, we're still, even the security community is still a ways away from this, uh, but it has come a long way. I believe uh, two years ago at DEF CON, they were able to get shellcode to uh, work on both I believe a FreeBSD Intel and a MIPS machine uh, running IRIX uh, with a single code base. Now, of course, there's, um, there, there's always the possibility that you keep two copies of an exploit along with your worm. So if you come up against an OpenBSD box, you use the OpenBSD version, or the, uh, uh, up against a Linux box, you're going to use the Linux version. Um, basically, that, that requires a very large database of exploitation techniques where typically worms tend to be small and fast. Um, uh, but uh, if it means attacking another 100,000 systems from having that database, sometimes that trade-off may be worth it to the worm author. I guess we're open to questions and answers here. Yes, in the back. Um, I believe there was actually a worm similar to that. Um, early on, I believe uh, the ADM worm uh, that attacked DNS servers uh, went through and uh, it, it what it, because it wasn't very public, it didn't attack a ton of systems, but you're right, absolutely. In, in that case, uh, finding statistical analysis of, uh, of worm attacks is pretty difficult. However, luckily, sooner or later you pass a threshold there uh, unless there's some uh, information being passed around, uh, sooner or later, if you infect, infect enough hosts, you will begin to show up on the radar, so to speak. Uh, the, the, the other flip side of that is that, uh, assuming that it, it's even a mildly interesting vulnerability uh, that, that is exploiting, um, the lifetime of that vulnerability probably isn't exceptionally long. Um, I, the, the sad fact of the matter is that the next code red that comes out and, and wipes out a system, even if it's not using the same vulnerability, it may be a roll-up patch that will fix your vulnerability. Um, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I, and, and that's the one thing that you have to remember is that you can't make assumptions about virus routers. And uh, like I said, the, the unknown, unnamed worm that I showed you uh, was basically the same in form and function as Code Red, but it was attacking a horribly old vulnerability. And the fact that it ever spread at all completely amazes me. But there are still people out there that have NT4 Service Pack 3 machines 
uh, and that, that's a vulnerable machine. Uh, if that worm, and that worm may still be cycling through the internet, I, I'm not even positive, um, but uh, if, there's machine, if, if there's food, the worm will continue to grow. Uh, basically, we need, anytime we target a worm, we have to cut off the food supply in the fastest, easiest method. Any more questions? Cool. Okay. Thanks, guys.